Hello, and thank you for joining. My name is Derek Kane, and today we're going to get into the topic of multivariate adaptive regressive splines, logistic regression, and survival analysis. This lecture is just one lecture in a broader series of lectures diving into topics of data science, machine learning, statistics, and predictive analytics. If you like this lecture, please feel free to go and check out some of my other materials. Okay, let's begin. The overview of topics that we're going to get into today are going to include a discussion on the extension of regression techniques. Then we will move into the Mars algorithm, followed by an introduction to logistic regression. Then we will dive into the topic of survival analysis. And finally, we will move into a practical application example where we're going to do some crime prediction in the US. And this practical application example is one from my personal consulting work so I get not only into the topic of the statistical models and the machine learning models, but also some considerations in actually applying it in the real world. In previous lectures, we have extensively reviewed the mechanics of multiple linear regression, including the various OLS assumptions. We have also spent some time building on top of this framework and extending regression into ridge regression, lasso and elastic net techniques. There are even more variations of linear regression such as polynomial representations and other variants which we have not fully explored. The purpose of this presentation is to further expose us to advanced regression topics both linear and nonlinear and continue to build off of our regression knowledge base. So when we talk about polynomial regressions, we can look at the chart on the right hand side and we can see that different representations or polynomial functions will give us different shapes of curves. Now these are still linear regression models, but just how we arrange the formula can even give us you know, different insights on in how we build up to our linear regression techniques. We didn't really dive into the topic of polynomial regression too much in my lectures, but I just wanted to show you, you know, a different form. In statistics, multivariate adaptive regression splines, or MARS, is a form of regression analysis introduced by Jerome Friedman in 1991. MARS is a non-parametric regression technique and can be seen as an extension of linear models that automatically models nonlinearities and interactions between variables. The term MARS is trademark and licensed to Salford systems. In order to avoid trademark infringements, many open source implementations of Mars are called Earth, or some variation kind of playing off the whole you know, planet idea. But for the purpose of this lecture, we're going to talk about the technique as multivariate adaptive regression splines, or Mars. Well, why use these Mars models? Well, Mars software is ideal for users who prefer results in a form similar to traditional regression while capturing essential nonlinearities and interactions. The Mars approach to regression modeling effectively uncovers important data patterns and relationships that are difficult, if not impossible, for other regression methods to reveal. Mars builds its model by piecing together a series of straight lines with each allowed its own slope. This permits Mars to trace out any pattern detected in the data. The Mars model is designed to predict continuous numeric outcomes, such as the average monthly bill of a mobile phone customer or the amount that a shopper is expected to spend in a website visit. Mars is also capable of producing high quality probability models for a yes, no outcome. Mars performs variable selection, variable transformation, interaction detection, and self-testing all automatically at a high speed. There are some areas where Mars has exhibited high performance results, including forecasting electricity demand for power generating companies, relating customer satisfaction scores to the engineering specifications of products, presence-absence modeling in geographical systems, 
MARPS is a highly versatile regression technique and an indispensable tool in our data science toolkit. This section introduces MARS using a few examples. We start with a set of data, a matrix of variables x and a vector of the responses y with a response for each row in x. For example, the data could look like this. So we have our data set on the left and then we have a plot of the data on the right hand side. Here there is only one independent variable, so the x matrix is just a single column. Given these measurements, we would like to build a model which predicts the expected y for a given x. So we're going to build a simple linear regression. And the linear model for the above data is minus 37 plus 5.1x in this case. Before we dive into the mechanics of Mars and some of the other regressions, I just want to take a quick moment to have a refresher on OLS regression. Now, if you want a more thorough breakdown of these techniques and diagnostics and you know, how to measure the effectiveness of the models, please refer back to some of my previous tutorials, most notably the EDA analysis one and uh, the introduction to regression techniques. So here, what we're looking at is we have, on the left-hand side, we have a chart with various data points spread, and we have a line that is fitting through these data points, and it's represented by the formula below the graph. Well, when we look at this line, not all of the points are touching the line, and for each observation, there are specific errors related to it, and we can see these errors for a particular given point shown on the graph on the right-hand side. Well, when we take the square of the error value and then sum the total errors to reach the sum of square error. So one way to think about these errors is if you just square the error, you come up with these ge uh, geometric shapes of squares. And if you take all these squares and you sum them up in total, you reach the sum of squares. And what the OLS-based approach is trying to do is it's trying to minimize this error by producing a line with the lowest total sum of the error. So they're trying to produce the sum of areas, the square, if you will, that is smallest. The basic idea is similar with the Mars algorithm. Let's take the following chart as an example. So we have data that's spread it, not quite in a, in a true linear way. I mean, there's some bends and kinks in the data. Well, if we try to create a linear regression or a simple linear regression model, it will create one with the smallest square error, and it might look something like this. And we can see the basic error in the chart below. However, if we fit a linear line on only a small part of the line or the spline above, we can measure the error related to that specific spline and that portion of the data. So the example on the right-hand side is we have just a small section that is being modeled with a straight line. And we can see the errors related to just those data points uh, is somewhat small because the line is fitting a smaller section of the data. We then create a pivot point and then add a second linear line connecting to this line to create a knot in the model. And then we do this for the next section of the model, and so on and so forth. So each one of these lines has different errors associated to each one of the lines. The resulting model will have a lower overall error term and can match the pattern of the data in a much more elegant manner. So when we look at this particular chart here and we just kind of trace the shape of the line, we actually see that it fits the data very well. And when we compare it to a linear regression technique, we, we find that it actually uh, has a lower overall error. In order to truly understand Mars models, we have to first understand the concept of a hinge function. And a hinge function are a key part of the overall Mars models. A hinge function is the point where a linear regression model's line is shifted into a different linear regression line. There are two functions, with one being the hinge we are looking at utilizing, and the reciprocal. 
The hinge functions are the expressions starting with max, where max a of b is a if a is greater than b, else b. Hinge functions are also called hockey stick or rectifier functions. This is primarily due to the characteristic shape, shape of a hockey stick that the hinge functions sometimes take. A hinge function takes the form max of 0, x minus c, or max of 0, c minus x, where c is a constant called the knot. The figure on the right shows a mirrored pair of hinge functions with a knot at 3.1. One might assume that only piecewise linear functions can be formed from hinge functions, but hinge functions can be multiplied together to form nonlinear functions. A hinge function is zero for part of its range, so it can be used to partition the data into disjoint regions, each of which can be treated independently. For example, a mirrored pair of hinge functions in the expression down below. This creates the piecewise linear graph shown for the simple Mars model on the left-hand side. When we turn to Mars to automatically build a model taking into account nonlinearities, the Mars software constructs a model from the given x and y as follows. In general, there will be multiple independent variables, and the relationship between y and these variables will be unclear and not easily visible by plotting. We can use Mars to discover that nonlinear relationship. An example Mars expression with multiple variables is shown below. This expression models air pollution, or the ozone level, as a function of the temperature and a few other variables. The figure on the right plots the predicted ozone as wind and vis vary with the other variables fixed at their median values. The figure shows that wind does not affect the ozone level unless visibility is low. We can see that Mars can build quite flexible regression surfaces by combining hinge functions. It is useful to compare Mars to recursive partitioning, and recursive partitioning is also commonly called regression trees, decision trees, or cart models. And we did a, a series of lectures on decision trees earlier that get into the concept of these classification and regression tree models. So some pros of the Mars software is that Mars models are more flexible than linear regression models. Mars models are simple to understand and interpret. Compare the equation for ozone concentration to, let's say, the innards of a trained neural network or a random forest or support vector machine. Mars can handle both continuous and categorical data. Mars tends to be better than recursive partitioning for numeric data because hinges are more appropriate for numeric variables than the piecewise constant segmentation used by recursive partitioning. Building Mars models often requires little or no data preparation. The hinge functions automatically partition the input data, so the effect of outliers is contained. Mars models tend to have good bias variance trade-off. There are some cons that are worth noting with the Mars model. Recursive partitioning is much faster than Mars. With Mars models, as with any non-parametric regression, parameter confidence intervals and other checks on the model cannot be calculated directly, unlike linear regression models. So cross-validation and related techniques must be used for validating the model instead. Mars models do not give as good of fits as boosted trees, but can be built much more quickly and are more interpretable. And also, the Earth, MDA, and pulse spline implementations do not allow missing values and predictors, but free implementations of regression trees, such as RPART and PARTY in R, do allow missing values using a technique called surrogate splits.
Now we're going to shift gears and move into the topic of logistic regression. When we revisit the classic OLS regression model example from before, we see that the value of the regression line is continuous in nature. In other words, the regression line can range in value from negative infinity to positive infinity and is what we call unbounded. In order to introduce the idea behind logistic regression, let's just take the following example. Well, what if we wanted to utilize a linear regression model on a variable that is not continuous in nature? Let's say we want to predict a yes or no variable that we've encoded into a binary response. So a zero represents no in this case, and a one represents the value of yes. When I personally think about binary response variables like yes or no, I immediately think about probabilities, even though this is subconscious. You know, if you were to talk to me 10, 15 years ago before you know, I was really getting into the topics of data science, you know, I'd think about yes or no type scenarios, but I wouldn't be thinking about the probabilities associated with it. But now that I'm thinking in more of a statistical mindset, when you think about yes or no, it's really just a spectrum of probabilities. And to kind of further build on this idea, let's take the following example. Imagine you ask yourself this question, would I like to get some pizza for lunch? Well, the answer is I really would like some pizza. This is common. I, I think about it every day you know, around 11.30 or noon. I then ponder how badly I would like pizza and begin to associate a probability that I'll order a slice for lunch. If I'm really hungry and craving mozzarella, the probability will be much higher to saying yes, or the number one in this case. However, if I just ate a large sandwich, I'll be full and the probability will be much lower. And I'll probably say, no, I, I don't want pizza, or have a value of zero. So an example here, after I ate my large sandwich, well, the probability I will get pizza is probably less than 10% now. At some point, we have to say whether or not we will get up and purchase the pizza. There comes that critical decision time where we say, okay, I'm going to get it or I'm not. Another way to put it is at what probability threshold will I go from not getting the pizza, a value of zero, to actually getting the pizza, a value of one. The general idea is that we state that if the probability is 0.5 or below, or 50%, we won't get the pizza. If it's greater than 0.5, then let's get the, the pizza. And I use the example here of Two-Faces coin. Two-Face is a, a supervillain in the DC Comics Batman universe. And th what this villain does is, for all of his critical decisions, he has a coin that he flips that is a two-faced coin. One side has scratches on it, the other side is just a normal face on it. And so whenever he has a decision that he has to make, he flips his coin, which is a probability of 0.5 whether or not it's going to be heads or tails. And then depending on the outcome, uh, he'll either say yes or no to whatever decision he's confronted with. And it's really a fascinating character, and the types of decisions that are made by Two-Face in the comic books are really remarkable. And if you've ever seen uh, any of Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, and if you've actually seen the Two-Face film on this, you can most certainly see you know, how this comes into play. This cutoff probability point, this 0.5 threshold, if you will, is a very interesting idea, and it's the basis for a lot of statistical theory. So logit and probit models, and we'll, we'll get into some of these in the upcoming slides. If we were to create a sample plot with the outcome variable, a yes or no, on the y-axis and the probabilities on the x-axis, we would see something like this chart. So if I have probabilities ranging from 0 to 1 on the x-axis and our response, we will see a lot of no decisions. So the, these are the responses of 0, and then 
all of a sudden we will see a shift and then we will see yes decisions. And at a certain threshold we will see this. This blue line represents the probability of 0.50 and it's the exact point where we shift from no to yes. This point is sometimes referred to as an activation function. If we were to construct a line to encapsulate this idea, it would probably look something like this. Now I drew this shape in Excel and my lines were a little finicky, okay, so there really shouldn't be that many curves on the edges here, so please just bear with me. But if you look at it, the the shape that we're seeing is generally referred to as a sigmoid curve, which resembles an S pattern. Okay, and this S curve pattern is a central concept to logistic regression. There are a couple different forms of the sigmoid curve in logistic regression, which are called logit and probit based models, although there are other log link functions. We can see the subtle difference in the sigmoid shapes here on the right hand side. The difference in how they function is fairly minor and a skilled statistician will know when to use one variant over the other. So if I'm looking at these two curves on the right hand side, they have similar shapes. I mean, they have followed this S-shaped curve, but one is more pronounced than the other. And this shape is important, you know, when trying to decide the outcome of a binary response variable, such as a yes or a no. We will focus our efforts on the logit model in this presentation. Logistic regression is used to predict the odds of being a case based on the values of the independent variables or predictors. Because of the dichotomous nature, the zero or the one of the dependent variable y, a multiple linear regression model must be transformed in order to avoid violating statistical modeling assumptions. And here we see the transformation of a linear regression into a logistic regression. And we're going to break this formula down in detail in the upcoming slides, and we'll get a little bit into the math for those who are interested. It is necessary that a logistic regression take the natural logarithm of the odds of the dependent variable being a case referred to as the logit or log odds to create a continuous criterion as a transformed version of the dependent variable. Thus, the logit transformation is referred to as the link function in logistic regression. Although the dependent variable in logistic regression is binomial, the logit is the continuous criterion upon which linear regression is conducted. The logit of success is then fit to the predictors using linear regression analysis. The predicted value of the logit is converted back into predicted odds via the inverse of the natural logarithm, namely the exponential function. Therefore, Although the observed dependent variable in logistic regression is a zero or one variable, the logistic regression estimates the odds as a continuous variable that the dependent variable is a success or a case or a one in this. In some applications, the odds are all that is needed. The basic approach is to use the following regression model. The odds is the odds that the event E occurs, namely, where p has a value 0 to p to 1, which is the, and p being the probability value in this case, we can then define the odds function as the following. The logit function indicates a mathematical relationship between the probability and the odds ratio as depicted on the right. The concept of the odds and odds ratios can sometimes be misinterpreted by non-statisticians. To provide additional clarity, we will use the following definitions. And I think it's important that we have a really firm understanding of what odds are and what odds ratios actually are. So odds is the ratio of the expected number of times an event would occur to the expected number of times it will not occur. 
the odds ratio for a binary variable, 0 to 1, it is the ratio of the odds for the outcome 1 divided by the odds of the outcome equal 0. The logit function is the log of the odds function, namely logit e equaling natural log of odds of e, or as follows. Based on the logistic model, as described before, we have the following formula. It now follows, and then so we are able to then build into the probability of an event. For our purposes, we take the event e to be that the dependent variable y has a value of 1. If y takes only the value 0 or 1, we can think of e as success and the complement e prime of e as failure. The odds ratio between two data elements in the sample is defined as follows. Using the notation p of x equals probability of x, the log odds ratio of the estimates is defined as Follows. Although logistic regression model, the logit of y equals alpha plus beta x, looks similar to a simple linear regression model, the underlying distribution is binomial and the parameters alpha and beta cannot be estimated in the same way as for simple linear regression. Instead, the parameters are usually estimated using the method of maximum likelihood of observing the sample values. Maximum likelihood will provide values of alpha and beta, which maximize the probability of obtaining the data set. The maximum likelihood estimate is that value of the parameter that makes the observed data most likely. Defining P as the probability of observing whatever value of y was actually observed for a given observation. So, for example, if the predicted probability of the event occurring for case i was 0.7 and the event did occur, then the probability is equal to 0.7. If, on the other hand, the event did not occur, then the probability is 0.30. If the observations are independent, the likelihood equation is as follows. The likelihood tends to be an incredibly small number and is generally easier to work with a log likelihood. Ergo, taking logs, we obtain the log likelihood equation. The maximum likelihood estimates are those values of the parameters that make the observed data most likely. That is, the maximum likelihood estimates will be those values which produce the largest value for the likelihood equation. Example, get it as close to 1 as possible, which is equivalent to getting the log likelihood equation as close to 0 as possible. Now that we've talked a little bit about maximum likelihood estimators, I want to now dive into some of the properties of these estimators. The ML estimator is consistent. As the sample size grows large, the probability that the ML estimator differs from the true parameter by an arbitrarily small amount tends towards zero. The ML estimator is asymptotically efficient, which means that the variance of the ML estimator is the smallest possible among consistent estimators. The ML estimator is asymptotically normally distributed which justifies various statistical tests. And this picture on the right-hand side is of Ronald Fisher, who in 1922 introduced the method of maximum likelihood. In the statistics world, Ronald Fisher is one of the pioneers of many of the methods that we use today. So he truly is a giant among statisticians. Now we're going to shift gears and move into the topic of survival analysis. Survival analysis is a set of techniques that study of events of interest where the outcome variable is the time until the occurrence of an event of interest. Effectively, what we're saying is survival analysis is the study of time. 
not like time series or predictions of statistical time series, but the variable of interest is actually time. Survival analysis attempts to answer questions such as, what is the proportion of a population which will survive past a certain time? Of those that survive, at what rate will they die or fail? Can multiple causes of death or failure be taken into account? How do particular circumstances or characteristics increase or decrease the probability of survival? Let's now get into a very brief history of survival analysis. These events of interest in the medical field typically represents the mortality rate for experimental drugs and medicines. The analysis generally produces a time frame until death, which is why the technique is referred to as survival analysis. In experimental medicine, amongst other considerations, is generally seen to be effective when the survival rate is extended for the experiment beyond the control. Survival analysis is the technique which allows for this determination to be made. So when we think of survival analysis, generally think of the effectivity of experimental medicines. And when we have cancer treatment drugs, you know, how long will a person survive when they are on these type of drugs? And if you think of it that way, you will always understand the context of survival analysis. Well, here are some applications of survival analysis. As we talked about with the medical drug testing, there's reliability analysis in engineering, duration modeling in economics. We can look at event history analysis in sociological scenarios. In criminology, there's criminological analysis that we can look at. Business applications include customer lifetime modeling, uh, churn rates, if you will, in the actuarial science and risk modeling components for insurance applications, there are many uses of survival analysis. And we can use it in biology, such as botany and zoology. In order to successfully prepare a survival analysis, we must first introduce the concept of censoring. Let's imagine for a minute that we're trying to understand factors which can cause the lifespan of a human to be shortened. In our mock example, we're going to collect data from 1990 all the way out to 2050. So I'm depicting on the right hand side a very simple graph where we have an arrow of time moving forward to the right hand side and we're going to start collecting represented by these dashed blue lines in 1980 and we're going to collect all the way to 2050 which is the length of our data collection for this particular cohort. When imagining our data set, we might think about variables that influence the lifespan of a human, such as their diet, their exercise, socioeconomic conditions, etc., etc. However, we will also think about whether we have data related to the full lifespan of a person. Are we collecting data from the date of birth to the date of death for a particular subject? Well, what if the subject is still alive after the study has concluded? Well, this concept is called censoring, and we're going to get into this a little bit in the next couple of slides. If we are collecting random samples of people to include within our study, then it is entirely possible to believe that we will find individuals that do not fit neatly into the walls of 1980 to 2050. Let us showcase this idea by representing the lives of individual subjects with an arrow. So if we look at our chart on the left hand side where we have our walls from 1980 to 2050 and each arrow is representing a unique individual, well we can see that some people were born well before 1980 and die shortly after 1980. 
There are some people who are born maybe in 2010 that are living well beyond 2050. And we find some people that maybe were born in 1983 and they die in 2025 and so on and so forth. Individuals who fit within these walls are shown with a green arrow and those that do not, the censored observations will be shown by either a red or orange arrow. Therefore, we can think about censoring as a form of a missing data problem. Additionally, there are two types of censoring that we should be aware of, right censoring and left censoring. Right censoring will occur for those subjects whose birth date is known but who are still alive when the study ends, the orange arrows, if you will, that we see on the right-hand side. Okay, this is a, an example of right censoring. If the subject's lifetime is known to be less than a certain duration, the lifetime is said to be left censored, or the red arrow. So they lived before the study, and they don't make it through the entire study. Okay, so they die shortly within the study, but their origin um, pre-existed the length of data collection. The data scientist will need to formulate a plan on how to treat censored observations during the exploratory data analysis. You know, what do we do with these censored observations? Do we omit them from the study, decrease in our sample? Uh, how do we treat these particular variables is something that we have to consider uh, as we're collecting our data and moving it into model building. The survival function is the probability that the time of death or the event is greater than some specified time. So the, here is an example of a very simple survival function. A survival function is composed of the following. It has an underlying hazard function. And the hazard function is you know, how the risk of death per unit time changes over time at baseline covariance. The effect parameters, how the hazard varies in response to the covariance. Usually, one assumes a survival of zero equaling one or a hundred percent, although it could be less than one if there is a possibility of immediate death or failure. And what this is essentially saying is that at the start of my study, so when no time has elapsed, a hundred percent of my population is still alive, or the event uh, of interest has not occurred. The hazard function, conventionally denoted as lambda, is defined as the event rate at time t conditional on survival until time t or later. That is, t is greater than or equal to t. The hazard function must be non-negative, and its integral over 0 to infinity must be infinite, but is not otherwise constrained. It may be increasing or decreasing, non-monotonic or discontinuous as depicted on the right. So we can see that the hazard function can take many shapes, and one shape that is very well known is called the bathtub curve. And this is uh, well known in engineering circles, and that's what we see with the blue line up on the top of this chart. Hazard and survival functions are mathematically linked by modeling the hazard, we obtain the survival function. Here is an example of the survival functions for individuals with differing types of cancers. The x-axis consists of a length of time, and the y-axis is the survival probability, represented as a percentage, or a proportion in this case. In this example, all of the subjects were alive at the start of the study. So y equals 1, or the survival function of 0 equals 100%, as we had discussed earlier. At year 10, approximately 20% of individuals with colon cancer survived. 40% survived with prostate cancer, and 65% survived with breast cancer. 
When I was first learning about survival analysis in grad school, I had a moment of clarity where I, the analysis started to make sense to me. And when you look at these particular charts that we see on the right hand side, when evaluating these charts for analytical insights, look for the separation between the various curves. If you see significant separation um, in between the red and the blue line or the blue and the green line, that's giving you a clue of something is driving that difference. So when looking at survival functions in, in graphical form, this is one kind of way that you can analyze the data that might lead to some key insights and ultimately a breakthrough. So you know, take my advice when you're looking at, at these type of functions, just look for the separation. It will lead you in a good direction. We'll now get into the topic of Cox proportional hazards model. Sir David Cox observed that if the proportional hazards assumption holds, or is assumed to hold, then it is possible to estimate the effect parameters without any consideration of the hazard function. Let y denote the observed time, either censoring time or event time for the subject, and let c be the indicator that the time corresponds to an event. So we have the expression below. This expression gives the hazard at time t for an individual with covariate vector expansory variables x. Based on this hazard function, a partial likelihood can be constructed from the data sets as follows. The corresponding log partial likelihood is denoted down below. This function can be maximized over beta to produce maximum partial likelihood estimates of the model parameters. The Cox proportional hazards model may be specialized, changing the underlying baseline function if a reason exists to assume that the baseline hazard follows a particular form. So to build on this idea, an example would include the Y-ball distribution, and when this happens or when we substitute the Y-ball distribution, we call this the Y-ball hazard function. And what's interesting here is that we are now borrowing some of the concepts of the maximum likelihood estimates that we were using in logistic regression. Now these are partial likelihood estimates, but the same underlying concept that drives logistic regression is essentially driving survival analysis as well. The Cox proportional hazards model is the most common model used to determine the effects of covariates on survival. It is a semi-parametric model. The baseline hazard function is unspecified. The effects of the covariates are multiplicative. And it doesn't make arbitrary assumptions about the shape or form of the baseline hazard function. This model also has some key assumptions that the covariates multiply the hazard by some constant. For example, a drug may have the subject's risk of death at any time. And the effect is the same at any point in time. Violating these assumptions can seriously invalidate your model, so you have to be very careful when building survival models that you are taking into consideration these key assumptions. This concludes our introduction to Mars, logistic regression, and survival analysis. We will now shift gears and focus on a practical example where we will be predicting crime in the United States. Being able to reasonably predict the individuals who are most likely to commit crimes is of significant value to the criminal justice system. Specifically, if the individual is within custody and a judge needs to decide whether or not they are at risk for recidivism. And what recidivism is saying is that I have committed a crime and I'm in custody. The judge is deciding whether or not to keep 
me in jail or to let me free to society. And if the judge lets me free and I go about into my normal ways and I commit another crime, that second crime is considered an act of recidivism. Data science can help to shed light on the underlying factors and when used appropriately can aid the, just, the judicial system in decision making, particularly in pre-trial. This improvement in decision making reduces the costs of inmate housing and has a societal benefit through keeping the low risk offenders out of the prison and the high risk offenders behind bars. This case study is one from my consulting career, which I have personally prepared from the data munging stage to the final predictive model. So I had my hands on all steps throughout this process. So I was in the trenches, I was getting my hands dirty with very raw and dirty data. I had to get it into a shape where I could work with the data and then build the models and then uh, drive the results from the models. In addition to writing up my findings in an official report, I have presented the techniques to a major U.S. city's leadership committee where they have used the results in the following ways. To build a risk assessment system that is leveraged in pre-trial decision making for recidivism. The refinement of a build plan for a multi-million dollar prison facility based upon the predictive model's results. Now, due to the sensitive nature, I will be randomizing the data and results to fit the tutorial. Most of the tutorials that I have shown, I have some R code or I provide the data sets behind the scenes. In this case, uh, the data that I'm showing here isn't the actual data that we've used, but the results are fairly similar and the approach is really what matters here. I will, however, go through some of the real-world considerations that I had throughout the process and showcase the preliminary results of our logistic regression model. So when we talk about data science and the techniques, you know, there's a lot of theoretical use of the models, but I want to just kind of highlight, you know, how do we take these models into everyday use and some of the challenges and considerations that I had throughout that process. The odds are high pun intended, that if you are reviewing this material, you have a strong interest in data science and know all of the latest and greatest machine learning techniques. However, I would suspect that a substantial number of us data scientists could not explain most of these algorithms to business decision makers in an intuitive manner. You know, for example, if you're talking about support vector machines and the kernel function and higher dimensions or neural networks, you know, the architecture of simulating how, how a brain works in a, in a mechanical sense, these are very difficult and abstract concepts. And I think a, a large number of us would not be able to explain these in a way that a business, business decision maker can make decisions. When I first started on this project, I was working under the former mayor of multiple US cities, major US cities, a gifted attorney and a Harvard professor. So he was the project lead of this project and I was the analytical support. I was the data scientist. He had understood the value of advanced analytics and launched a series of big data initiatives during his tenure as deputy mayor in New York City. While preparing my plan with him, I was fairly shocked to realize the difference in understanding between the public and private sectors in regards to statistical modeling. And what I mean by that is in the private sector, most of the businesses that we're working on were constantly innovating and were driving the latest and greatest techniques and were very quick to adopt these technologies and techniques into practice. Whereas the public sector, there are more layers within the structure within the hierarchies, if you will, that makes decision making a little slower. So when there is a revolutionary technique, it takes a while before it's fully integrated within a government entity. And I was never exposed to this before because most of my work was in the, in the private sector. But when understanding you know, how the actual day-to-day -day business works in the public sector, I was a little shocked 
on this. The reality is that the government sector is a little slower to adopt the technological advancements in machine learning. He expressed that if we are to be successful in establishing the value of these techniques within the judicial system, that we would need to emphasize interpretability of the algorithm over the predictive performance. This initially was somewhat counterintuitive to me because as a data scientist, we're trained to believe that, hey, we have to maximize our predictive performance. But now I understand the rationale behind this. If you can't explain what the algorithm is doing in layman's terms, the users, judges in this case, will become confused and then they'll begin to doubt the value of the technique. Once these judges and users are comfortable with the nuances of the machine learning algorithms and it's integrated into the judicial process, then we expand on the predictive framework emphasizing predictive accuracy. So the idea of we're going to slowly introduce a model, we're going to make sure everybody's comfortable with how this model is actually working, and then once they're comfortable with it, then we'll begin to shift the model into one that has higher predictive accuracy. But the trade-off in this case is that interpretability goes down. So a neural network might be more accurate in this case, but our ability to explain it in an intuitive manner will go down. This is ultimately why I settled on using a logistic regression to demonstrate how the tool can be built and then by using a random forest model for higher predictive performance at the expense of interpretability. So this entire approach was built around the strengths of logistic regression. Before we dive in in detail, let's take a moment to understand a little bit about the data we're working with here. The final core cohort was constructed from various databases in the prison system, judicial system, and bail bond system. And my samples in this case were about 4,600. The data set was also pared down to ensure that there were no instances of right or left censoring. So this 4,600 included the removal of right and left censored observations. This was important to ensure that our sample was representative of the population at large. Coincidentally, the data set now allows for us to readily perform a survival analysis. Some variables were constructed around the expert opinions of criminologists and extensive literature review. So when deciding on how to build up to this data set, we performed a extensive review of literature surrounding you know, what are the variables of interest related to criminal behavior. And what we were able to find out and validate is that there are certain risk factors based off of numerous studies. And we're showing some of these risk factors to the right, such as whether or not you've had a prior FTA, whether you've had a prior conviction, it, your present charge as a felony, if you're unemployed, if you have a history of drug abuse, and if you have a pending case, well, these are all risk factors that you're going to have an act of recidivism. I also spent a large portion of my time just trying to understand how to connect the pieces of data when working through the various disparate information systems. So we talked about the prison system having data. We have a system from the courts and from the bail bond systems. I'd like to believe that I'm fairly proficient in SQL through my time in the business world. I mean, I've spent a lot of time building business intelligence technologies. I'm very comfortable in a SQL Server environment. However, getting the data into modeling-ready format posed significant hurdles that business users rarely encounter. You know, a lot of times when we're working with data sets, we can very easily connect the pieces. You know, you just link uh, two fields together and then you're good to go. But these data sets and how they're constructed, the logic of them, were very tricky to work with. And I was surprised by that. I just thought, you know, hey, I'd get these, these extracts from these systems, they'd send it out to me, and, you know, I'd work my SQL magic, and then boom, I'd have it in data-ready form, and 
in a day. The reality is that the data mining process took about three months of intensive on-site work. I'd have to ask the business users or the government employees in this case, you know, hey, what is this piece of information? How does it work in relation to the others? And it really took a very long time just getting the data constructed. So I know a lot of you, you know, are feeling very comfortable and confident about, you know, working with data pieces, but I just want to, you know, share this little bit of wisdom from somebody who's been working with data for a long time that I, I wasn't ready for how difficult it was it actually turned out to be. There were a total of 15 variables which were included as potential predictive variables and with the response variable being FTA or failure to appear, a proxy for recidivism. So what we're talking about with this FTA, just to give a little context, is that you were arrested for a crime and you were brought in front of a judge and the judge decides in this case to say, okay, I'm going to let you out into society. I don't think that you are a risk. And, but your court date is going to be in three months and you have to be here and then we're, we'll figure out you know, what to do from there. Well, three months goes by and the person who is supposed to come to court does not appear. Okay, so they have a failure to appear or FTA. And this failure to appear, we're saying, is a proxy for recidivism. Even though it's not a direct criminal act in and of itself, which I, I actually think it is a criminal act, we're saying that just the fact that they didn't appear in court is functioning as a proxy for recidivism. Here is the listing of the final variables used for the analysis and a brief description. So if you're interested in how these variables were constructed and some of the encoding methodologies. Here's some background information for you. The FTA definition we used is depicted as a dichotomous categorical variable and formally defined as follows. A zero is an individual who has not had a failure to appear to court between the time the defendant was released from either the jail and their initial court trial in the county. Or a one, an individual who has had a failure to appear to court between the time the defendant was released from either the jail and their initial court trial in the county. The breakdown of the various considerations for the personal property and drug arrest types is as follows. So if you look at the variable list from before, we have these various offenses that we're calling personal property and drug arrest types, but there's a whole series of codes that the police departments use when categorizing various criminal activities. And so what we're calling personal would be codes related to assault, battery, kidnapping, homicide, and sexual assault. Property, which would consist of larceny, robbery, burglary, arson, embezzlement, forgery, receipt of stolen goods. And drug, so dealing, possession, prescription, and various drug types. Now we'll move a little bit into some exploratory data analysis, just to get a feel a little more for the data. So the first thing we'll do is we'll construct a correlation matrix, providing, which provides a visual indication of the relative strength of the correlation between each variable. A large red bubble depicts a more significant negative correlation, whereas a large blue bubble signifies a stronger positive correlation. By referencing the FTA row, this correlation matrix is showing that the variables felony indicator, drug charge, and personal charge all of which have red bubbles associated with them, may be indicators of potential predictor variables within our model. In general, there does not appear to be extremely strong correlations when we visually inspect the data. The next step in the overall approach involved looking at some automated variable selection procedures, such as forward selection, backward selection, and stepwise selection. And we talked about these topics in the EDA 
lecture earlier, so if you're looking for a refresher on how these techniques work, please feel free to go back and check out those lectures. The forward selection procedure had produced the following output in R. Only variables which contributed to the reduction of the AIC statistic, lower is better in this case, were incorporated into the final model. The variables month at address, employment, non-white, and FTA ever were found to be statistically insignificant and did not improve the model's performance, thus were removed from the model. And a key point that's worth noting is that the final model we presented included the employment and FTA ever variable, despite the fact that they did not meet the P less than 0.05 threshold here. So when we think about model building, we're, we're always taught that, hey, if the p-value is you know, less than 0.5, then we can use it. Otherwise, it's completely disregarded. In this case, because we had subject matter expertise, and we knew that certain variables um, historically were important in this case, we loosened these thresholds to accommodate the subject matter expertise within our model. So what you talk about in terms of statistical theory in the classroom versus what is actually applied in the real world, you have to be willing to bend a little bit in order uh, to, to address all of the subtleties related to this particular science. And when we're talking about human behavior, this is an inherently more random evaluation. So, you know, any type of, you know, formal, formal literature review um, that can aid in the discovery of these variables, we want to incorporate that logic as much as possible. The next step was to produce a binomial logistic regression model from the results. We utilize the GLM model within the base R. So building in R, we decided to construct our logistic regression. And the diagnostics of the model produced indicate that each of the variables included are statistically significant at a confidence level of P less than 0.05. Now remember, this isn't the final model that we had presented. This is just the results that we had from our, uh, our automated selection procedure. The charge class variable has been retained in the model due to the overall contributions to the model, even though some of the classes, type equaling B, are not statistically significant. This box plot shows that the Pearson residuals for the charge class variable are consistent. This indicates that the variable does not suffer from heteroscedasticity. Variability of the FTA is unequal across the range of values for different charge classes. This is an indication that the charge class variable can be retained in the model. Now that we've spent some time building our model, let's go ahead and let's take a look at the results in our final algorithm. In this case, we have the probability of FTA equaling the following. And if you remember earlier when we were walking through our logistic regression tutorial, we find that we can actually rearrange the formula to find the probability of an event. Again, we see this on the image on the right-hand side here. So in this case, we're just restructuring the formula so we are emphasizing this probability. And we have a number of variables. In this case, I encoded it uh, with some shorthand just to make it a little easier to interpret. The probability of FTA represents the probability that an offender will have a failure to appear based off of the model's parameters. The default threshold is a probability equaling 0.5 or 50%, where a value of probability less than 0.5 will produce a zero or no FTA, and the probability greater than or equal to 0.5 will produce a one or will commit an FTA. A discussion around calibrating the cutoff threshold will be addressed later. So this probability of 0.5, where we had talked about later, is the trigger between a 0 and a 1, and we can flex that a little bit, and, and we'll play around with that. 
the probability calculated can also be evaluated as a potential risk score for a failure to appear outcome. If the probability generated for a particular case is 0 0.05, this implies that there is a 5% risk for an FTA outcome based upon the specified model. And so we'll, we'll play around with this idea as well. The interpretations of the coefficients are not intuitive within a logistic regression model and require further explanation. There is an alternative representation of the variables which can be used to help drive decision making. This approach involves transforming the variables into odds ratios which can then be interpreted in a more intuitive fashion. So odd, odds ratios are our friends here. Odds ratios are used to compare the relative odds of the occurrence of FTA given exposure to the variable of interest. The odds ratio can also be used to determine whether a particular exposure is a risk factor for a particular outcome. An odds ratio of 1 implies that the variable does not affect the odds of an FTA. An odds ratio greater than 1 is, that, is depicting that the variable associated has a higher odds of an FTA. And if the odds ratio is less than 1, then the variable associated will have lower odds of an FTA. The odds ratio can compare the magnitude of various risk factors for that outcome. These odds ratios can be interpreted in the following manner. So for gender, an individual who is male has an odds that is 0.754 times less likely to have a failure to appear than a female controlling for the other variables, holding the values constant. So a female is more likely to have a failure to appear than a male. Age. For each year an individual ages, there is a 0.6% decrease in the odds that they will have a failure to appear controlling for the other variables. The odds value being so close to 1 implies that this should not have a considerable impact in determining risk factors. A charge class of D. An individual with a case ID where the most serious offense is a charge class of D has an odds of failure to appear that is 2.8 times higher than those who do not, controlling for other variables. So if you're arrested and your charge class is a D, which represents a particular type of crime, your odds of an FTA is 2.8 times higher than those who do not. Drug charge. An individual with a drug charge has an odds of FTA that is 0.624 times lower than those who do not, controlling for other variables. So if you are arrested for a drug charge, what we are saying is that you're probably going to show up to court. The odds ratios can be seen as indicators of an underlying risk for failure to appear. With this understanding, the variables which indicate the greatest risk of FTA include whether the crime is misdemeanor with a stronger odds than a Class C and also individuals who commit Class D felonies. So we're able to glean this type of information from our model. For example, let's consider the Class D type felony specific. There is a substantial increase in the odds, 2.8 times for having a failure to appear when the arrestee has this lower classification crime. This insight can be used by a judge when considering release of the offender and the costs associated with the failure to appear. So if I'm the judge and I have somebody sitting in front of me and they have a Class D type felony, when I'm deciding, hey, should I allow this person to go back into society or should I retain them, the thought that, hey, my odds are 2.8 times more likely for having an FTA to appear when I have this particular crime 
shouldn't be weighed in the general decision-making process. And one additional insight is that for each case ID in which the most serious offense is a misdemeanor, the odds for failure to appear increases by 2.1%. So if you have misdemeanors, your odds for failure to appear increases slightly. And each case ID represents a specific instance of a crime. So one individual could have multiple crimes and each crime would have their own uh, unique case ID. The model that we had specified with a cutoff of 0.5 has correctly classified 69.07 of the instances and incorrectly classified 30.93. The confusion matrix shows the various classification errors. This initial model has a specificity of 0.295 and a sensitivity of 0.901. These values describe the type 1 and type 2 errors. And if you're looking for more of a background in terms of confusion matrices and ROC charts, please refer back to some of the previous lectures. The predictive accuracy of the model can be visually represented through this ROC chart on the right-hand side. The area under the curve for the model is equal to 0.685. What this is saying is that this indicates that the model is 18.5% better at predicting failure to appear than through randomly guessing the outcome. So by utilizing this model, we're going to have an 18.5% better prediction than just randomly guessing. We need to discuss the cost of an error. There is an underlying concern when producing predictive analytics models related to the cost of a misclassification, particularly with crime. If the model predicts with 69% accuracy, then it must be incorrect 31% of the time. These classification errors represent real costs to the municipality and could be the difference between releasing an individual back into society and then having an FTA that costs the courts time and money. Or even worse, the released person commits a serious crime like murder. The other type of error would be that the county would place an individual into the jail system when they would not have had a, an FTA in the first place. This also costs the county time and resources and needs to be considered as well. If the intention would be to more uniformly balance the classification performance, the following approach can be utilized. We adjust the cutoff threshold from 0 0.5. Remember where we said if it's less than 0.5, it's a zero, or if it's greater than or equal to 0.5, it's a one, to a different probability threshold in order to mitigate the classification performance in type one and type two errors. Additional calibration work from subject matter specialists was necessary before this technique was to be used in practice. What is the cost of these classification errors and how do we find a more cost-effective threshold? Is it better to have more? If we're going to be wrong in the prediction, do we want more people to be in the prison system where the cost of the county is high or do we want more people to be on the streets? And we have to weigh the costs of, you know, the real dollar costs associated with both outcomes. And these questions became catalyst for additional follow-up research. So these are questions that criminologists are actively pursuing, and we actually subcontracted uh, a pair of brilliant criminologists who specialize in this one particular field to help calibrate our mo models. I would now like to take a moment to show you some techniques that you can use when trying to rebalance this probability threshold, because I think it would have some value. We explored two different techniques to further balance the performance based upon the cost matrix being identical for each classification. 
So typically when you have a cost matrix and you're balancing the type of errors, you know, one is more punitively weighed versus the other. In this case, we're just saying that, hey, the cost of the errors are going to be identical in the case. But in practice, we actually use something different. The chart identifies the ideal balancing point for a calibration of the probability threshold. The minimum difference threshold, or MDT, approach indicated to adjust the probability threshold from 0.5 to 0.71. This results in a decrease of correctly classified instances from the initial model and an increase of incorrectly classified instances. The MDT balanced model has a specificity of 6.443 and a sensitivity of 0.6429 and the confusion matrix is shown here. So by changing that probability threshold from 0.5 to 0.71, we actually found that the overall predictive performance was lowered because we're now saying there are going to be more zeros and less ones. In this case, the overall performance when it was rebalanced resulted in the confusion matrix that we see on the right-hand side. So we had a better balance of the specificity and sensitivity in this case, both are hovering around this 0.64, but at the expense of overall predictive performance. So this is just kind of highlighting some of the trade-offs that we see when calibrating these type of models. The maximized sum threshold, or MST approach, indicated to adjust the probability threshold from 0.5 to 0.691. This results in a decrease of correctly classified instances from the initial model and an increase of incorrectly classified instances. The MSC balance model has a specificity of 0.61 and a sensitivity of 0.67. The MST approach indicates a reduction in predictive performance from the initial model, but higher than the MDT-based approach. The change in the probability threshold balanced out the specificity and sensitivity ratios more evenly for both the MST and MDT approach than the initial model. And that's important. So we've built our logistic regression, we feel comfortable with our parameter estimates, and now when we're looking at you know, ways to further improve our performance, well, considering the cost of the errors in the overall approach, is important and by balancing these thresholds we're able to uh, mitigate some of these type 1 and type 2 errors. This now takes us to the final results. However, if the intent would be to use this model and the opportunity cost for a false positive was equal to the cost of a false negative classification, the MST approach provides a stronger mechanism to draw from the analytics for decision making. The MST calibrated model contains a 65.6% predictive accuracy, while more evenly distributing the classification errors. This model would indicate that an additional 966 individuals would be predicted to not have an FTA and 613 would be classified as having an FTA based upon the algorithm and the classification errors. This calibrated predictive model could be leveraged to potentially reduce the influx of defendants awaiting trial within the jail population by approximately 7.5%. This model can then be used to extrapolate the total amount of inmates within the prison complex provided the logistic model is being used exclusively. The predictions were then applied to the existing prison expansion plan and used to drive down the cost of the new facility by reducing the number of beds by 130 and saving the county 1.4 to 2.8 million annually for the county. Let's now talk about how we can expand on this idea even further. The next phase of the predictive model deployment plan would be to introduce a computer-based risk assessment system. The basic concept is as follows, and we're going to take a 20,000-foot view of the overall approach. A judge 
will enter the defendant's ID into the system when deciding whether or not to keep the person in jail for an FTA or if recidivism is a concern. This system will take into consideration demographic variables, their age, their sex, education, as well as behavioral variables, the number of prior felonies, time at address, etc. Then it will run the algorithm behind the scene and produce a probability level. The software assigns the probability threshold to a specific risk category. Then this risk category is shown to the judge. So if we look at our little table on the right hand side, we see the probability threshold ranging from zero all the way to 100% or one. Now we can use this as a cutoff to trigger you know, a zero or a one in our logistic regression. But we can also think of this spread of a spectrum as an indication of risk. So if the probability threshold is on the lower end of the spectrum, well, there's going to be a lower risk for an FTA. But if the probability is on the higher end of the spectrum, well, then the risks are going to be higher. So the idea is the judge plugs in some information in the system, they hit enter or they click on a button, and out pops a message, hey, this person's had a very high risk of an act of recidivism or an FTA. The judge then utilizes this information and their professional judgment when deciding whether or not to release the individual into the population at large. And I can't stress this point enough that we develop the predictive analytics models um, to aid in the decision making. In the case of we're talking about human behavioral characteristics, you know, until the accuracy gets to a certain threshold on these models, you know, there are some soft considerations that have to be brought in. And that's what makes a judge so important to the overall process. So what we're doing is we're providing an aid to the judge to help kind of keep them on a certain course. They can completely disregard the algorithm if that's what they feel. But if they're looking to substantiate some of their gut feelings in this case, well, we can draw from logistic regression and these type of techniques in order to indicate relative risk levels.